Good evening, everyone. My name is Jenny Ha, and I'm the Assistant Director of Education at the New Museum. Today, I join you from the unceded land of the Lenape people. I'd like to begin by acknowledging and paying respect to the Lenape people, elders, and ancestors, past, present, and future. On behalf of the New Museum, I'm glad to welcome you to tonight's conversation in conjunction with the exhibition, The Shadow of Spring, Artists Vivian Kakuri and Miles Greenberg, who will each discuss their practices, processes, and collaborative work for the exhibition. In conversation with exhibition curator Bernardo Mosquera, Institute for Studies on Latin American Art Curatorial Fellow at the New Museum. I would like to thank education and public engagement staff members, Austin D. Bose and Derek Wright, as well as the entire New Museum team for their help bringing this program together. Before we begin, I will share with you some brief introductions on our speakers. Vivian Kokuri is an artist based in Sao Paulo, Brazil. For the past 15 years, Kokuri has been developing installations, performances, drawings, and embroideries that investigate how sound can disorient everyday experiences, inspire new forms of living, and shift power dynamics in society. Kokuri's artistic practice seeks to highlight the active yet under-recognized aspects of sound. Miles Greenberg is a performance artist and sculptor based between New York and Reykjavik, Iceland. Through his installations, uh, through, sorry, through his performances, videos, sculptures, and installations, Greenberg examines the relationship and tension between bodies and space, with particular attention to qualities of time and ideas of duration, transformation, ecstasy, and exhaustion. Programs like this are core to the New Museum's work of advancing new art and new ideas. New Museum public programs are generously supported by the Bowery Council, and we also thank our members and supporters like you who help to make these programs possible. Without further ado, I'll pass this on to Bernardo. Hello, hello everyone. Welcome, thank you, Eugenie. Um, well, first of all, thank you, Vivian and Miles, for, for being here. I know that Vivian um, came all the way from Brazil specifically for this night, so. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> to buy clothes. <laughs> and Miles drove from, from Philly. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you so much. And it's been an, an amazing um, pleasure and privilege to work with you in this show. Um, and thank you all also for being here. And thank you. Uh, big thank you to our team, um, the New Museum team who made this uh, night possible. Uh, well, tonight we're going to chat um, a little bit about this show, The Shadow of Spring, uh, that gathers works by Vivian and Miles. We're going to talk about, um, Vivian is going to start by giving a presentation on, on her work and um, about the works, well, her artistic practice in general and the works here uh, at the New Museum. Then Miles is going to do uh, the same. And then we, we're going to open to have a conversation. Uh, so if you have questions, ideas, keep them, keep them to the end, because uh, we're, we're going to have the chance to um, chat a little bit. So uh, thank you so much. And Vivian, please. Sorry. Let me see if I'm in the room. OK. So um, I work mostly with sound, and sounds that are interesting to me are the ones that no one wants, <laughs> uh, the ones that people want to avoid, filter, repress, silence. And um, so this this performance is probably the one that gave me all my materials and uh, themes. This is called The Silent Walk, and Bernardo is there. <laughs> this is 2012, it's 10 years ago. Um, and yeah, he, he looks the same. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but that is in Rio. I'm actually from Rio. No, I'm from Sao Paulo, but I live in Rio, so I'm, I'm a Rio person. Um, and in this performance, I gather 20 people, more or less, and we stay in silence for eight hours walking around the city. And I curate these spaces that we're going to visit, and usually there are spaces like religious spaces, rooftops, uh, places where you normally don't go in the everyday life. So you hear different things. You hear you can have access to different activities. 
so I made this performance in different places. This is Latvia in Riga, which is naturally silent. <laughs> so, and the people are also very, it's, there is a cultural difference to silence, as you can imagine, from Brazilians to Latvians. Um, so that is also very interesting uh, in this, in this uh, performance, where I, I also understand listening through a kind of um, anthropological uh, point, standpoint. And this is in the Amazon. Um, so the Amazon was amazing, and probably the most difficult one to to uh, organize and you know understand what the path would be. Um, you know, even more than Latvia, uh, even with the language barriers and everything. So, but most of them happened in in Rio. So in Rio, during these researches, I found a lot of materials. So you can see that there's a lot of like disposal of materials. And at that time, Rio was being renovated for the Olympics. So there was a lot of like mesh screens, uh, iron uh, bricks that were disposed by, you know, by these renovations, urban renovations. And this is one of these, this mesh, you can see here, I transformed that into, um, it's a sound work because these, these are bells. So this is the very first one that I made from these found materials from my own performance. And I kind of like got uh, addicted to this material because it's so, um, f there are so many possibilities in it. You can, this one is cut and uh, unweaved. So I called it like a reverse tapestry kind of uh, uh, method, uh, but you can also, go ahead and like uh, be much more uh, ambitious with it, hang things, embroider, paint, uh, unweave, so many different things to do with it. So this is a more recent one where there's a lot of materials and a lot of weight, so it's very resistant. Um, so I've been uh, also researching uh, the status quo of music in Brazil, let's say. and. Uh, I've been paying attention to sound systems that are usually put out on the street because of also because of this performance where I was constantly looking at uh, musical activities and sound activities in the urban space. And this is a very old picture of how sound systems, trunk sound systems used to look like uh, maybe 15 years ago. And now they're <laughs> getting like bigger and, you know, huge. And um, so, but, you know, uh, it's being regulated everywhere and um, repressed and confiscated. And uh, so they love to show this, like this is the, um, the police department where they take a picture of what they confiscated and they, they you know, there's like drugs, guns, and then sound system. <laughs> so I think in Brazil there is this, um, it's a mixture of uh, obsession over, uh, speakers, but also a, um, a will to control and silence certain genres of music. And usually, of course, you can, um, you know, these genres are, they are attached to uh, all the other problems we have according like to, you know, race and class. And of course, this is the poor people's music that is being repressed and silenced. So I think, um, you see, this is <laughs> this is the picture of like there is bullets, guns, and then uh, sound systems. Uh, another one. So um, I think it's uh, yeah. There's <laughs> you can go like goes forever. So I I made this 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 is one of um, an, an official event where uh, in Bahia the most musical state of Brazil destroys a line of 200, uh, 200 meters of sound systems. And you know they stopped the city to show that. So I, I thought that it was in a way, in a very evil way, very cathartic. So I wanted to uh, bring people's uh, these to people's like sensation. They had to feel what it feels like to destroy this artisanal, amazing sculpture that is the sound system because they are all handmade in Brazil by Brazilians. So I gathered. Um, I I went to the the city hall. And we managed to get all these apprehended sound systems. And I threw a party with the sound systems. And in the middle of the party, uh, we destroyed the whole line of sound systems. 
and it was like a um, uh, emotional roller coaster because we were like dancing and that at some point everything was being destroyed. But uh, it made people feel like the pain of losing all the, that equipment. And I think that it's very important for us to have to have that sensation in a kind of body uh, level. So you can feel that there is loss in, in, in that work. It's not machines. They are sentient beings. <laughs> they are sentient things, you know. You can um, do a lot of uh, cultural activities through that. So we gathered all the pieces and... Um, I showed uh, the destruction inside of a museum, and together with this, with the pictures. So, um, so that's why I've been paying attention to to just the sounds that are usually are uh, unwanted and repressed. So, I of course I go to religious music because it's a, a field where a lot of sounds are prohibited in Catholic music. Drums are prohibited, uh, were prohibited. So I made a whole work about. Tr turning chants into drumming and into like bass again. Um, so I studied one of these chants, one of the first ones that were ever found in, in paper. And uh, this chant is played in this sound system in the form of like bass and beats. So I can show you how it uh, looks like because then it's... Uh, when you see the candles are say, reflecting this uh, beat. Base so you can see what's happening with the state. with the music. When you see these candles, they pulsate uh, to the base, to the low frequencies, and that works as a metaphor to what happens uh, inside of us. Cause so I'll go fast because. I <laughs> so and then uh, these. Um, Screen works were, uh, you know, following up the, the forms that I was interested in, in these totems. And so I made works that, you know, are inspired by these uh, tot totemic sound systems. Um, and again, like something bigger that looks like a sound wall. This is actually a sound work because you have the screen here with the light. And there are hidden speakers in, in this room where there's this faint echoes of reggaeton that I recorded in New Mexico. So it is a sound work, but it looks like a, just a, you know, um, this unweaved screen in the shape of a sound system. This is this was shown in, in Shanghai. Um, and then finally, be, uh, Base Maze, which was the work that I showed in New York just before, um, uh, The Shadow of Spring. Uh, it, this is it, this is the br Brazilian version. So it's a sound system that is covered in glass, and this glass is just it's the one that civil construction uses. Like big corporate buildings use this exact exact glass, which is a semi-reflexive glass. It's it looks like a, um, a window, but it's not. You can see it from from uh, from the inside. And this was made in the, on the Highline Art Program like right in front of where the construction sites are. So I wanted to have like a hybrid of a sound system with a building and see what, you know, what happened if I played and DJed in a sound system like this. And what happens is, is that people, they, they listen to the music, they feel the music just like, like maybe with a little less bass, but they look at themselves and such, so they are like looking at themselves the whole, the whole party. <laughs> and it becomes this hedonistic, uh, narcissistic party, you know, like just like every party we know, <laughs> but you know, like in a more obvious way. Um, so after this, like at least, I think it was by the, the same time that I started photographing these parties and getting inspired to depict the whole scene of the party, the parties that I'm throwing. And that this one was made just after COVID uh, when everyone was vaccinated and could go to parties. So I started throwing parties in my own studio. Um, this sound system that you see here in red, it's the one that I have in my, in my studio. Um, and it's a large studio. I have privilege, pri privileges, privileges, it's hard to say this word, <laughs> uh, there in, in Rio. Um, I st I'm in this building for a long time and I have a large space. So I'm like, I'm going to use my studio to be also a nightclub. 
um, there was a post-COVID decision, of course. Um, so this is the scene of the first party I threw. So I I took pictures of people and also mixed I also mixed with pictures from uh, um, New Year's Eve, which is a huge party in in Rio, and also some scenes from uh, you know medieval drawings that I love. It's something I love and collect. And um, this is um, oh, there are some you know famous people that I will not mention mention um, friends. <laughs> there are friends. Um, there is myself there somewhere. Um, so this was the starting point for the, the you know, um, the, this one that I have here. So it's, it's a, this one is uh, cut in half. So you have this, the party that is going on and people are happy about it. And this is the like hangover where people are like, was this worth it, you know? Uh, the depression that comes after some parties. I think everyone knows what this feeling is like. Like, I shouldn't have gone. This was a bad party. And I wanted to uh, show that the party has a, a shadow. You know, there is, uh, you, you're running away from something or going towards something when you're in this hysteria, in this like uh, euphoria. But uh, these things that you want to, you know, keep uh, hidden, they somehow, they show up. At, you know, at that maybe during the party. <laughs> so um, yeah, that's the most uh, the part that is sadder. So these gatherings, these social gatherings, and things that happen uh, in where there's music and people, I also depicted in like through mosquitoes. I'm not gonna go further in mosquitoes because it's a whole other <laughs> part of my work, but I've been working with mosquito sound and mosquitoes and mosquito scientists. Um, mosquitoes are big in Brazil and they are everywhere. Like if this was Brazil, there would be one like biting me right now. <laughs> so it's a companion species in a sense. <laughs> uh, so I think they are very interesting. And every time I say like everyone hates mosquitoes, but every time I say I work with mosquitoes, people are like, Oh, that's so nice, you know. Like so, there's there's something charismatic about mosquitoes because they are so like evil and horrible. <laughs> so this is um, so you know. I think here uh, we can say more about how we came out with uh, everything, but um, I think we had both a very a big interest in the nightclub and music and uh, how people dance and how people move to sound. Um, so I just uh, kind of continued the method that I had uh, of like taking pictures of people while they are, you know, surrendering to sound and surrendering to music because I don't know, I think we are so controlled. Uh, we are always like so conscious of whatever our body is doing. And when we are in a nightclub, that's when it slightly changes, you know, that's when you kind of like melt into something bigger and just something like, in a, like a, you know, in a soup of people and sweat, hopefully. <laughs> so um, I just continued doing this same thing, which is taking pictures of people. Sorry to interrupt, <laughs> but maybe I'll, I'll just give a brief intro introduction about sure. what was the um, um, the whole idea um, behind um, the, the shadow of uh, offspring. An introduction that I forgot to give at the beginning. <laughs> um, but the shadow of spring is a is a, um, an exhibition about the phenomenon of uh, vibration that investigates vibration and vib and how vibration affects different bodies um, and can trigger transformative experiences, um, especially transformative collective um, experiences. I knew that that Vivian and Miles, um, through different ways and with, di with different um, intentions, um, they have been researching and dealing with vibration. I invited them. They had never met before. They met literally at the New Museum in the first day of installation <laughs> in person <laughs> after working uh, four months um, online in uh, very intensely. Um, and it was very beautiful to see how this relationship
um, was built throughout the, the months. And now they are even like coordinating looks, as you can see. <laughs> we actually didn't do that on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> Which is even better. Um, but it was beautiful to see this, this intimacy growing and this partnership growing. Um, and at the, at the show, we have two um, works by Vivian. This is w one of them. This is uh, Vessel Body. The other one is Vessel Flame. And we had two works by Miles. And the sound piece was composed um, by both of them. It's a sound piece completely um, built from, composed from the sound of their guts, of their organs, of their bones clicking, of their hearts, etc. Which was, um, yeah, kind of trying to get to um, a house bit, which was a, re a request from one of our colleagues who's a, um, uh, a guard here in the room. So he was like, please, this time, bring us a house music. <laughs> and okay, we, we can do that. And, um, and yeah, I just wanted to, to, give, to give, yeah, this general introduction so you can talk, talk, a little, talk a little bit more about the works themselves, how you got to them, and uh, yeah, and especially how you created the sound piece together. Oh, I also, yeah, sorry. <laughs> also, uh, something important to, to say, to position myself in relation to, is that I, I know Vivian for maybe 13 years, I don't know. She was in my first show, in my very first show, and we have been collaborating a lot. And Miles is the very first time that we were, that we were together, we've been following the work for the past years. So it was also beautiful to see from, the, from these two different distances how this relationship was being, um, built and i think that's it and that's something that we all have in common uh, is that we are all like very um like party monsters a little bit or <laughs> party babies <laughs> and, uh, and in different <laughs> like in different <laughs> and in different ways and something that i want to um maybe ask at the end of your uh, of both of you um, of yours your presentations is to understand what do we learn from the experience of vibrating together. Um, so this this uh, work has sound, and the sound was entirely composed here. Um, and we were like keen on having. I, I was not interested in bringing like commercial sounds, something that would like oh that feels like techno. But it's not, you know, I, I didn't want that. So I would start from changing the materiality of that electronic sound. So I recorded with a stethoscope and contact mics, uh, you know, noises of my gut and lungs and Miles' lungs. He was working out to get louder yeah, sound. Yeah, we, we wanted like a harder bass line, so I did burpees. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we did it here in this room, actually. So uh, I can show you how it looks like. This is <laughs> this is the composition. For it's not new for anyone that uses live, um, but I will show you. Um, so here, this can you see this this sound here, like the representation of sound. This is actually one of our um, recordings of our body. So when I, when I um, choose this one second of sound, I can, uh, you know, rep repeat it over and over with different speeds and then it becomes this. So yeah, you can hear several. This is one. So I started from like building techno with the things that it usually has. So like a kicks. And then hi-hats is something that it, almost every electronic music has. And the hi-hats, it doesn't sound like a body, but it is part, like it comes from a recording of our bodies, but in a different speed so even even like sounds that sound more harmonic can be done in that method so this is also <laughs> 
this is this comes from our from our body this all of that can be done but there are more there are things that you can you can hear actually hear miles this is miles and it's coordinated with the the rhythm of the It was also really interesting how radically it changed from recording the lungs from here to down here. Yeah. You know, because sort of different spaces, different volumes inside of the body that we, you'll get a different read. Different liquids. So the gut have a lot of liquids and the lungs, they have like mostly texture of the air. Like this is, for example. Different, different lunch. Yeah. <laughs> this is you working out. Yeah, this right this now. is uh I think a combo of like my breath and my heart like post cardio from like <laughs> yeah. we should have pulled up the video of it. <laughs> I know you have a video of it. shakes because I'm I'm use, I I love bass so um, I think bass is the one is the sound that makes you like uh, touch people's body without touching without touching with your hands you know so that's the most like textural um, uh, the the most connected to sex <laughs> I think when the first time that I saw like uh, a rave party of everyone was gathering in front of the of the subwoofers and like attached to them and they were like uh, so out of reality because they were just feeling this like a magnet so that kind of image is impressed in my brain forever <laughs> so yeah that's the yeah that's how i composed so you record different combinations of the sounds and uh, I left a few um, stops, a few silences, so we can hear Miles' beautiful uh, water drips from that you know that are pouring out of the the sculpture. Cool. Should we change the computer. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Vivian. Um, I'm Miles, and I do performance, um, and video, and kind of newly sculpture. And I am sort of just going to blast through a bunch of imagery of my work. Um, but I'm kind of personally more keen on Q and A than talking too much about my practice. So I, yeah, I. I thought I would start with just like embarrassing myself and showing the first performance I ever did. Um, this is a performance called Chandelier, which I did in 2015, and I was at the end of high school. And this was the first like public performance I'd ever done. I, um, you know, I wasn't particularly drawn towards the kind of solitude and discipline and practice and repetition that came with painting or drawing or even sculpting by hand for the most part. I'm gonna use this thing, why not? Chekhov says if there's a pistol on stage, it needs to be shot, so. Look how glamorous that is. Okay, um, yeah, so this was a piece where I borrowed a friend's loft and I don't know how it came about. I was having a conversation with a friend at a party and I don't know, there was some joke about being the chandelier or something, you know, something, I don't know. Um, so I thought that's a fabulous idea. And I decided to 
suspend myself by these like chains drill into the ceiling you know suspend myself like three meters in the air um invite like you know a hundred people between the hours of like mid uh 11 and 1 a.m or so uh and i would just have these candles and be like the only source of light in the space and uh so i put out a you know cheese platter and champagne and uh prosecco uh left the door unlocked left a note on the door and just sort of went for it kicked away the ladder and it was great it was sort of my first you know introduction to duration which would later become a really really big part of my practice um you know via various mentors uh and uh you know sort of a um I I think it needs to be noted, and it's funny because people ask me this a lot, like why I started with duration, and this was like, a, I guess, like a three-hour performance. Um, and for me, it was a question of accessibility. It was about allowing people to enter the space and sort of consume the work um, in their own fashion, to their own accord. And... Um, create their own sort of experience, give them agency. Um, I was very shy and kind of not, I, I think there was a there was a much bigger rift for me between um, between what I wanted my art practice to be and theater than you know what what sort of I had access to and sculpture, if that makes sense. Like my performance practice felt like a shortcut to sculpture way more than a shortcut to, theater and, and and in my brain it was much less sort of proximal to that um i liked looking at the winged victory of samothrace i liked looking at you know sculptures in the louvre and in in the met or you know places like that um where ostensibly they'd be there forever and i could be there forever or i could be there for five minutes i could take a photo i could take a call i could do whatever i want and i could access it so you know freely and that created very few barriers between myself and the object, you know, in, in a, a performance space, uh, traditional performance space, I felt like a certain accountability uh, to the work and to sitting through it in this sort of very proscenium fashion that I didn't ever really identify with. Um, so anyway, this hurt a lot. Um, I didn't know it would. <laughs> um, but it was interesting because as the wax was melting on me and as I was hanging from this harness that was not made for these purposes. I restaged it with a rock climbing harness later on. Much better idea. Um, I bought this from like a sex shop. I, yeah. Uh, like child, very uncomfortable. <laughs> and um, yeah, it was very interesting because as people sort of got, you know, there was more of a detente in the space, I was going through a whole other process. And this was, this was sort of my intro into like, okay, duration may be something else other than just letting people come when they want and, you know, not wanting to entertain in front of people and have them come for like a complete piece that's perfectly resolved because I'm not. Uh, it was more about letting people in and then on my end, having a very physiological experience. So anyway, um, that led to a whole bunch of other just like random performance experiments, most of them in nightclubs, parking lots, uh, Montreal, 2015. Um, eventually I moved to Paris, had a residency there uh, at Palais de Tokyo after a few years. And I produced this piece called Alpha Ville Noir, um, which I don't really feel like talking about it, <laughs> but it was fun. So we, we, we created this video work and then it was sort of switched algorithmically, uh, you know, to, uh, that would sort of live choreograph these the same performers that were in the space every so often. And we just did these vast performance experiments over like five hours every night. Um, funnily enough, okay, this is definitely the place to mention it. This was happening at the same time as none other than the Astor Gates exhibition at the Palais de Tokyo. So this was also my last institutional show. So by some weird cosmic tie, I have been downstairs from the Astor <laughs> since 2019, um, <laughs> uh, which I told him. Um, yeah, that led to this other piece that I produced there, I Know Roman, so eight hours. This, these were like five hours and 35 people. Um, 
And I just, I, it was such a massive space. I needed so much help to fill it. So I just hired everybody that I knew from the, you know, from the local ballroom scene, from the, you know, from, from, you know, there was like a realtor. There was like people that I'd met uh, just like going out and, you know, in these sort of underground spaces and, you know, wherever. Um, Cause for about three years of being in Paris, nobody wanted to give me any space to do anything that I wanted to do. Um, performance wise so I really had to kind of you know again like work my way through these circuits um, which was a lot of fun but you know it, it took a long time before there was any kind of serious interest in, in in you know something that was a little bit more immaterial um, this was an eight hour performance with six performers eight hours a day three days um, myself included. I always put myself in the performances, not because I want to be necessarily, but because uh, I'll always do at least the first one because it just, you know, to test that it's safe. I have more control when I'm on stage. If it's a solo work, I'll do it myself and then maybe hand it off later. Um, but yeah, um, I can also demand a lot more of my own body than I feel comfortable demanding of somebody else. Um, this is when I moved to New York shortly thereafter. Uh, this was a piece that I did called Hemotherapy One at Rena's Ballings. Um, I moved to New York uh, out of a certain frustration that I was having with France, and after three and a half years, and you know, trying and failing to to have a sort of a a real interest in kind of durational performance, and always kind of being relegated to like being the sideshow at like a show of you know something else <laughs> um, during the opening, like for a couple of hours. Um, or again at a club, I was like, I really wanted to be in a contemporary art space. And I, oh yeah, I dropped out of school very young. I was like 17. I dropped out of what would be the equivalent of grade 12 here in the US. Um, so I was like, I'll go back to school when it makes sense. And then this was the year that I was like, let me go back to school. So I tried to apply to Cooper Union and I came here and like, just like waited for my application to be accepted or denied and I didn't get in. So I was like, I'm here. <laughs> so I did this show and, um, I don't know, it became, it, as I sort of practiced this performance more, you know, again, it like very much in clubs and, and kind of dark spaces and places where people are not necessarily having their full wits about them, but that are still ultimately about transformation. Um, I felt um, very drawn to a certain sense of ritual in it. And I wanted to kind of create these rituals that were very distilled and happened in the daytime where you could you could walk into the space and, and uh, you know, there was something quite immersive about it. You would be hit first with a smell. Um, and then light, and, and there was something very transformative about the threshold of the door, you know? Uh, again, thinking about nightclubs, thinking about that, that the door. The door is a whole performance in and of itself, right? Um, and I've held the clipboard, and I've been accepted and denied through the clipboard. The clipboard is everything. So it's sort of creating this, like, this, this, this real threshold where, you know, something happens in your brain as soon as you cross through it. Um, so I kind of wanted to bring that sensibility into these these ritualistic spaces where somebody could articulate an emotion that you know maybe I was trying to kind of set the stage for. So this th these became like this series of seven hour performances called therapy because I felt like I needed therapy. <laughs> um, and then this one I was just like I don't know what this feeling is, but I have something in my blood, and I just felt like exercising. And I was thinking a lot about you know. Um, bloodborne disease and I was thinking about bloodletting and I was thinking about just this boiling blood boiling all of the analogies and sort of literary myths that you can put around blood so I made this stark white body with this kind of long strip of raw meat and flower petals and spices and things that stain just to create this incredible tension and I held this beaker on my head for all seven hours very good balance in my head for some reason but I don't know. Um, and uh, and I, I rigged this this little drip. Um, I was very fascinated with the idea of like a drip, like an IV drip coming from the ceiling. Um, Bob Wilson once told me time is vertical and space is horizontal. And I don't know, is this one like weird arbitrary rule that he sort of came up with that I was like, somehow that makes sense. So 
as a means of keeping time without keeping time. I wanted to kind of create evidence of uh, create evidence of time essentially through this vertical motion. So the drip became a very important part of my practice. This water droplet, you know, one drop a second would f slowly fill up as night fell this beaker and it would get heavier and heavier and heavier. Um, so the tension just grew and grew and grew. So yeah, it looked like that. That's fun. Um, got asked to do another one here also in New York. This was pneumotherapy. This was about the lungs, grief, you know, sort of like respiratory malaise or something. I don't know. I was very fascinated also by, I, I had learned that um, the plague doctors in during the bubonic plague in Europe, these you know the kind of iconic beak masks. Those masks were actually stuffed with herbs and flowers um, because they believed that if they smelled good things, it was just like that was their idea of medicine. So this was all like these were like creating fake treatments for myself basically that would ultimately emanate in you know in a space and allow other people to somehow partake. For seven hours, you know, and uh, so here the drip was an actual IV bag um full of corn syrup so it you know created this very dramatic almost like crystallization on my body um huge stem of magnolias four thousand plus stems of lilies hyacinths everything that just opens up your lungs in a crazy way uh, i based it off of the garden at the beginning of tchaikovsky's solaris sort of the last moments he's on earth and he's experiencing this kind of grief Grief is like held in the lungs in so many different cultures and spaces that are totally disconnected from one another. Um, the before and after. They had a shower. I like showers. Um, like a week after I did that performance, COVID. <laughs> um, so, you know, big effect on performance um, as a practice. This piece was called Oyster Knife, which was in the middle of the deepest moment of, you know, July 2020, like the pandemic, Black Lives Matter, all of it. And I was secluded in Montreal and I convinced a theater to let me do this live stream with the Abramovich Institute curated by Marina, where I ended up walking on this conveyor belt. I was like, if we don't have production, if we don't have spaces, you know, I loathe the idea of like a Zoom performance. And I was like, I, you know, if, if we're going to do... If we're gonna do it it needs to be so hardcore and badass and without being like just for the sake of it like poetic but also it needs to push so far that we break through that you know barrier it's so banal uh so i decided to walk on this conveyor belt just consecutively 24 hours without breaking um which was the hardest thing i ever did I did it and I passed out for 23 minutes around hour 18 and I came to on my own uh but yeah that piece then turned into an installation but yeah sort of still with this performance and then just like a bunch of other stuff uh eight hours a day eight days um consecutive in Bangkok during the biennial there um again the drip this were five points of corn soap where I was basically being like candied onto this steel structure. I was thinking a lot about like levitation and uh, the like exorcist. I just really liked that image and it felt very airborne. Uh, the embrace. Um, I'm going to plug something right now. Uh, this, <laughs> this piece is actually being restaged here in New York at the end of March. Thanks. Um, oh, at uh, uh, the Far Show Foundation in Greenpoint, Farshaw. Um, this piece, basically two people that don't know each other every day, blinded with these blinding contact lenses, uh, come into this box and embrace and hold each other onto this stone and support each other for like, you know, eight hours. So I cast it very meticulously so it's people that don't know each other before. Um, so it's like complete strangers that meet for the first time by touch and have to continue to touch for eight hours. I did this in Copenhagen, so I was thinking about the mermaid and like, what if she was black and two people? Um, bringing back the box. Uh, I have a weird uh, phobia and it's of butterflies and moths with these eye patterns. Like, 
looking at them gives me just like severe agita. Um, so of course, naturally, when Sky TV and Marina Abramovich asked me to stage a five-hour performance for TV in London, I decided to cover myself with them. Um, here, okay, this is the part I actually wanted to get to. Uh, late October was a piece that I was asked to do at Galleria Continua outside of Paris. Um, that was the space. And I had sort of been hiding out in Iceland for a while, and this was a crater that I came across that I really fell in love with. And um, so I had this idea to kind of create uh, almost like a levitating field, you know, kind of wet pond space, whatever, um, with these, these figures that were kind of rising out of columns, uh, a little bit like video game characters, like on a selection screen. Uh, and these columns would be rotating and they'd be sort of holding these ceramics and um, anyway, and basically two by two, they would go and fight in very slow motion. Um, so that turned into this late October. Um, you can see back here, like in that lowered part, which was where the, the uh, silo used to sit when it was a factory. Um, you can see the, the shadows of two performers who are, uh, sort of in this very slow motion, very tense kind of, you know, wrestle, um, almost like the, the battle stage. If anybody's ever played like, you know, Mortal Kombat, that was what this was about. Um, and it was sort of just like this, yeah, this very slow kind of drip of very sensitive. Like I find that when you when you increase the sort of viscosity of, of, the, of the space, of the time, um, of the way that people are perceiving time and enacting time, uh, you know, on stage, uh, and the public is like freely ambulating around this, mind you, you know, um, you really mess with people's perceptions and really give them, you know, a certain, uh, I don't know, a certain, a certain sensitivity to change, to nuance, to their own bodies and to, to the bodies of others. Um, yeah. So this was like, 20 centimeters of water all the way across with pigment and these plants were rotating and I was also just like enamored with the sensuality of this giant techno crane that we were using to film it document it and I'd been making videos for all my performance but I'd never made sculptures so um and there's the sort of the fight that's me um so I scanned it later um, I had this idea where I was like, I want to find a way to capture the motion. I don't know. I was looking at like futurist sculptures and, you know, just like how, how can I kind of depict that temporal viscosity in something static and something that I don't have to be in all the time? Uh, how can I sort of like project that part of my body outwards into, uh, you know, into something that stands free and alone? Uh, and then I can maybe experience my own work. Kind of crazy in it, you know, in a different way than being uh, obviously in it. So I played around with, uh, I spoke to a scanner and, and I played around with the equipment a little bit and I was looking at kind of what the different options were. We landed on this one 3D scanner that's called the Artec Leo that looks like a travel steamer, if you've ever seen one of those, like a, it's like a little kind of gun like this. And basically what we did here in New York was six months after this performance, um, I was I would watch I watched the footage from late October from this last piece, recreated a lot of the motions, um, and we would scan it. And I went into the, all the settings of the you know the 3D scan like the guy the engineer had no idea what was going to come out when I did this, uh, but basically went and turned off like a hundred settings to make it all to make it effectively dumber. Um, and what came out was this very bizarre glitch where it no longer has any ability to correct itself uh, or recognize repetition. So you get these figures that kind of rise out of themselves and, and change. Um, the other really fabulous part about this process uh, that I fell madly in love with is the fact that these take, because of the amount of data that you end up accruing through that process, um, they take about 70 hours, 40 to 70 hours to render. Um, so you have no idea, just like a performance, uh, what you're going to get as a final product. 
And I could afford to do one of these sessions <laughs> the first time, you know. Um, so I was like, basically all my eggs in a basket. We had six scans and these were the three that we ended up moving forward with. Um, so of course they're like one pixel thin. So technical process, we add a little bit of an extrusion later just to kind of create some depth. CNC millet. It's very, I love this robot arm. It's very like Bjork, all is full of love. Um, yeah, these are my many heads. Uh, and then we painted it to look just like the bodies in the, in the performance. Um, this was the makeup in the actual performance that you can see, which we used a castor oil mixed with pigment. And so I recreated the performance as sculptures. And this is like my wildest dream. I'm like, I was obsessed. <laughs> so I did this in a space in Toronto because I was like, I needed space to mess up uh, before coming to a stage like here. And this was the video, the way that we installed it. Water, we pretty much recreated it to a T. And then, yeah, this whole series. Then basically, what I really wanted to end up ultimately, you know, do doing is um, I wanted to make a 3D scan from a performance directly. You know, I, I wanted to I wanted to remove those six months. I wanted to remove as much space between the performance and the object as possible. Um, so I did this performance called Fountain One. I'll just show you a very, very quick clip. Where I was like bleeding profusely for seven hours. And um, that, we scanned it, this arm, there's a scan, look familiar. This double elevation happened by total accident. We don't know where it came from. And then they're here, so yeah. So that's pretty much my art. <laughs> All right, thank you, thank you, Miles. Um, we're almost, yeah, without time, but we have some time, let's say. I don't know if um, anyone has a um, question, okay. Okay. We have a you like do you, the the time of the performance like you said keep saying like the eight hours or seven hours that means like no break just kept standing on there for seven hours yeah no breaks very impressive <laughs> thanks <laughs> all right any other questions. <laughs> um, this question, I think, is for both of you, but I had Miles in mind uh, for obvious reasons. What does, what role does recovery um, play in your practice? I mean, even if you were uh, to identify as a masochist in some ways, it seems kind of I parallel don't. to your art. Uh, I, yeah, I guess, I mean, that's part of the question. Um, uh, at least then it would be, you know, instant kind of relief karma. But what is your practice of recovery after these performances look like? Um, it, it, it depends. Netflix. Netflix. Uh, yeah, actually, Netflix. honestly, um, a lot of sitcoms, a lot of sitcoms. I really like watching Golden Girls after performances. <laughs> that helps a lot. Um, no, also just like vitamins. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, it depends. After this silent walk, um, it's also eight hours, <laughs> the work shift. Uh, we go have dinner and we start talking to each other for the first time. And it's the time where I find that everything I thought from these people is totally wrong. 
because sometimes they have this horrible face, like this long face, like, oh my God, they are hating this performance. And in the end of it, they're like, oh my God, this changed my life, I love it. So like the face becomes something else, you know, when you're only listening and when you're not talking. But that's a recovery, like eat and drink and uh, talk. Wait, I have I have a quick question for you, Vivian. Actually, because I actually don't know this. Do, when you're doing performance, do you prep? Like, do you do you do you like to prepare yourself? Sorry, I I totally. <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah, I think yeah. We need a you know a proper body functioning and uh, and energy. But the prep for this uh, the silent walk was a map. You know, a map and a lot of negotiation of like, we are going to be here at that minute and we will not be able to speak. Are you going to be there with the key? Because we will not be able to speak. So that was the preparation. Then very stressful because sometimes people didn't show up. And like now I'm stuck, like muted. I'm, I'm on mute and I can't do anything. So I have to kind of improvise when that kind of thing happened. Yeah, That's real. All right. Any other questions? Yeah. What do you think we should do next? Are you going to work together? Um, Could you hear back there? Yeah. All right. She asked us what our next projects were and uh, if we're going to work together again. This was like, I don't know, this felt like a very long durational first date. <laughs> um, yeah. I. Next, I'm doing a residency in Miami, starting next week. And then I have two shows opening here in New York in March. Um, one of them is Farshaw, and then the other one, I don't think I'm allowed to say it yet for another like few days, <laughs> so I won't. Um, but they're both in New York City. I'm going to a residency in the Netherlands to prepare a new performance. Uh, this performance, I'm going to recreate the sound of a tropical forest, sound by sound, using only my mouth and my husband's mouth. <laughs> He's way better than me. Um, and we're going to recreate all these animals, uh, minerals, everything with our mouth. And that's where we're going to prepare in the Netherlands. And my next show in the U.S. is in Texas, in Austin, contemporary Austin. All right, Vivian, other Vivian. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I wondered if Bernardo, you could share a little bit more about your decision to put these two artists together who didn't know each other, and a little bit about this durational first date. How it is that you came to learn of each other's practices and integrate your practices into a single space yeah for sure um so i've been researching the idea of vibration for some years now and experiencing it um and i could see in, in vivian's work and in my work um interest in that in that regard um and i found them in a, in a way complementary vivian has been researching as she, well, she showed here, researching sound for like 15 years. She published a book called What I Do Is Music and yeah, really interested in, in about the multiple dimensions of sound, really um, the material dimension of sound, the spiritual dimension of sound, um, the political, ideological dimension of sound. Um, while Miles, um, I could see that he was also interested in the multiple dimensions of the space, um, of the uses of the space, really interested in the tension between bodies and the space, uh, the spaces of intimacy, the spaces of fear, the spaces of love, of sorrow, um, and how those, those things can happen at the same time. So I felt that they would get along together. <laughs> And I just sh um, I showed Vivian's work to Miles and Miles' work to Vivian, and they were like, "Yeah, I think we could, we could have developed something." I've seen one of his your performances before. He you introduced me. Um, that was the moth, the moth performance. What's it called? Uh, Lepidopterophobia oh. exercise. Yeah, yeah that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry about it. So, I, I, because I also have that phobia, so we are united in our f fears of mm, giant moth. 
And I and I had uh, also research in their work. I could do, I, I could find moments in which they were talking specifically about the experience of the dance floor, which is something that I have been uh, researching and writing about for a while. Really talking about the political dimension of the revolutionary dimension of um, the dance floor. So I felt that they would get along together. And, and you know what? Also as a creator, how sometimes we have those you know this intuition that we that we have like I think this could work and it did it wasn't of course easy all the time <laughs> but it was um amazing amazing to see also how uh, in the process of developing their personal uh, individual works in the show they also responded to each other's um previous works and the works that they were developing at, the, at that moment um Vivian showed the, uh, the image, but I don't think she mentioned it. But even in, in her embroidered pieces, there are references to some scenes or moments of previous uh, performances by Miles, which was um, also uh, so beautiful. Did I, I, I hope that I, yes. <laughs> I also have never, I don't know about you actually, and, and I don't think we've really talked about this at length, but um, that's, the date is still happening. Um, but I've I've personally never done like a conceptual collaboration like this before, you know, to, to this extent. Like the only people I've really, I can say I've ever really collaborated with are the composers who I work with, the music. Uh, sometimes I do my own. Um, but for sound and for perform, like the performers who I work with, if it's not a solo work. Um, so this, I think we, the way that we were exchanging and the language we were sort of using between us was like almost more like around the idea of cross-pollination and almost like hacking each other's universes a little bit, like where my, the colors of my stones were really picking up the kind of the, the coloration around the, 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 the tapestry and, and like Bernardo mentioned, the, the figures, you know? So yeah, I don't have, are you more in tune to collaboration like that? Yeah, too much. <laughs> um, sometimes it goes very wrong and it, when it goes wrong, it's so, so bad. <laughs> It's so bad when a collaboration goes wrong. So, uh, and, but you learn how to 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 feel the signs. And I didn't have any red flag from you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh. <laughs> I'm kidding, but um, <laughs> you can go so wrong, really. I, I will not tell you. If you want to, you know, ask me in a bar i will tell you <laughs> but um yeah but usually musicians and the musicians have an active role because i don't play every everything um i collaborated with pianists with uh, composers um organists uh, balalaika russian balalaika players that was the most radical one yeah specific no musicians are Awful. They're almost as bad as actors. I'm married to one, so watch your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, maybe we have time for a, la a last one. Yeah. Or yeah. Give something weird. <laughs> um, I don't know. If this is going to be weird. Um, Miles, I think I read somewhere that the moth performance was in reference to your work by Zhang Huan. Yes. Yes. I wondered um, how much of that work you were having in mind when you were preparing this one. What do you think were the differences, the overlaps? I mean, I know two works, so I know they're, they're obviously different, but I just want to know what was going in your mind as you, as you were preparing that work. Great question. Uh, I think that's another sort of kind of collaboration in a way is, is you know, or maybe more the kind of, quote unquote collaboration that I have experience with is like referencing um, you know the past and um, you know no one has invented the wheel uh, so the two biggest references for that piece were um, McQueen um, spring summer 2002 uh, with the Voss the, the box that shattered and this woman sitting in the middle which was in turn a reference to a photograph by a photographer whose name I'm forgetting right now uh, and Zhang Huan, 12 square meters, um, who uh, obviously Mr. McQueen is deceased, so it was no longer a possibility, but um, Zhang Huan, I actually reached out to and we, we spoke while I was working on that work. Um, and, you know, similarly, I actually just did a performance at the Louvre that is a performance based on St. Sebastian where I'm, you know, 
impaled with some real arrows. Um, somebody who helped me with that is actually sitting right here who stabbed me for the first time. It's a lot of fun. Don't recommend it, but it's fine. <laughs> did you feel healed after of your phobia after that, or did you get worse? After the piece? Uh, oh, yeah, no, just before I forget, the person I wanted to mention for that piece was Ron Athey, who inspired the Saint Sebastian piece. Yeah. But um, no, no, I did not. <laughs> I, briefly, briefly. Uh, not permanently. I definitely see them in a different way. Um, it took me, you know, it took me actually until the end of the performance, we had two different species to pick up one of the bigger ones, like the huge Atlas moth. that's like actually genuinely this big. I know. Right. Yeah. But it's, <laughs> it's the lights and the leather. <laughs> yeah. I hope that answers. Okay. Maybe a last one. Are you going to kill me? No. Okay. Uh, maybe a last a last question, especially if it's a weird one. Okay, it doesn't need Something to be like weird, deeply weird inappropriate. For this <laughs> Come on. All right. <laughs> it could be inappropriate. Um, have y'all gone out um, like together at a, a long night out, a nightclub? Um, <laughs> what's the tea there? And are you gonna do that <laughs> to solidify this collaboration? did with a curator at some point in Brazil. I mean, me and you, we had many yeah. stories. Yeah. But us, we we did. We did have a... We um, had like an after party. Yeah. We had an after party. We went to... We had an after party and then we went to... We ended the night at um, Boiler Room. That's the tea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I would say we had, we had a bonding experience this night. Yeah. You know, you know what's crazy? I'm going to make a really deep confession on this stage right now. I've still never been to Brazil. Um, so I'm holding both of you accountable right here and now. You open your relationship audience. first and then go. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. And, and now, now, now we continue at... Uh, you know, <laughs> what's yeah. the bar? Where do we where do we keep this running? This is gonna be live on YouTube tomorrow. <laughs> Got it. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, maybe the next show is gonna be about it. Who knows? <laughs> um, but well, I think you you wanna say something about it or should I wrap, wrap it up? No, um, I'm I'm about yeah, I'm sorry. about I... you opening your revolution. N no. <laughs> okay. All right. So, um, do you want do you want to say something else before before we take it away? Thank you for coming and Amazing. thank you so much for being here. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much.